Good evening and a very warm welcome to the Royal Opera House, to the audience here in the Claw Studio upstairs, and to all of you watching worldwide via our live stream link on YouTube. My name is Amy Lane and I am the head staff director here at the Royal Opera. Now, this season we are thrilled to be presenting for the first time ever on the main stage of the Royal Opera House, Shostakovich's The Nose. It's a gloriously absurdist work in which a civil servant wakes one morning, discovers that his nose is missing from his face. Chaos ensues as the rogue nose catapults its owner into a battle against the authorities and the nose itself, whilst bureaucratic systems break down in the face of so unusual a problem. Tonight, we're taking a look behind the scenes at Barry Kosky's new production, which will be streamed live to the Opera platform on the 9th of November. It's time now to enter the bizarre world of Shostakovich's The Nose. evening we will be joined by Head of Music for the Royal Opera, David Cyrus, who will introduce us to the fascinating, boisterous and darkly comedic music of the opera. <coughs> Members of the cast who will tell us all about their approach to creating these extraordinary characters, and director Barry Kosky, who will be talking all about the creation of the world in which the story is to be told. But first, from Oxford University, Professor of Russian Literature, Andrew Kahn is here to tell us all about Nikolai Gogol's career and short story, The Nose. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Andrew Kahn. Good, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as a contribution to our thinking about Shostakovich's opera, I'd like to speak about the writer Nikolai Gogol and the story on which it is based. Uh, let's begin with a few scenes from Gogol's fictional universe. Uh, odd things happen in that world, especially in the classic Petersburg tales, of which The Nose, published in 1835, is one. Consider some events from Gogol's plots. A man walks past a delicatessen and admires strings of hams and sausages displayed in the window. It's not that unusual. He does a double take. Inside the window, he sees hanging alongside the bacon an old granny. Or consider this. A married couple seek to christen their child, and they rehearse a litany of names with great inventiveness. Their choice, in the end, is Akaki Akakievich Bashmachkin. It translates more or less as non-shit, the son of non-shit, Little Slipper. Little Slipper being the surname. Well, little non-shit, son of non-shit, Little Slipper, uh, grows up rises not very high in the civil service as a clerk, and channels his fantasy life into romance. But since this is Gogol, the love object is his own overcoat. In general, the erotic in Gogol elicits situations of grotesque pathos. In another story, we enter the routine of a man who keeps a diary. His first entry is dated 3 October and is entirely mundane. His preoccupation on the 3rd of October is with how well he has polished his shoes. We read on a few pages and find that the year has skipped ahead to 2000, day 43. Turn the page and the diary records no date, while scrupulously noting that the hour is between, quote, night and day. The more bewildering fact, however, is that the diarist is no longer recording his own thoughts. Instead, he faithfully puts down a conversation he has overheard between two dogs. The story ends famously with the portentous line, the day of Algiers has a pimple on his nose, which has nothing to do with anything and is a piece of a logic, comic a logic that is fairly typical of Gogol. Consider, similarly, 
among non sequiturs, the opening page of Dead Souls, uh, the greatest of comic epics. Two peasants observe a wheel come off a carriage, and they ponder aloud. Quote, will it roll all the way to Moscow, asks one. It will, says the other. Will it roll all the way to Kazan? No, to Kazan it will not roll. The two peasants are on to something. They seem to warn the reader that Gogol's novel might roll this way or it might roll that way, because in Gogol's world, the inconsequential matters at least as much as the consequential. And then there is the nose, the story that formed the basis of Shostakovich's opera. A barber bites into a freshly baked loaf at breakfast, only to find a nose inside. The barber recognizes the nose as belonging to his client. Now, that really is pretty unlikely. <laughs> um, I suppose the barber has the client by the nose. Uh, the barber recognizes the nose as belonging to his client, collegiate assessor Kavalyov, and in his flustered state, furtively tries to dispose of the organ. When Kavalyov himself awakens that morning, he hastens to the mirror to examine a pimple he noticed the day before on his nose. He fears that the blemish might spoil his chances with a young lady whose powerful father could benefit his career. And when he looks in the mirror to check whether the spot is gone, what does he find? He finds what we already know. There is no spot because he no longer has a nose. And over the course of the story, that nose becomes the nose with a capital, a veritable anti-hero who leads a parallel existence to its hapless progenitor. He or it outdresses, outsmarts, outwoos Kavalyov. Indeed, the nose generates so much activity that all of Petersburg is rife with rumor that not one, but three noses are on the loose. <laughs> there is a counter logic at work in Gogol's world. Experience tells us that organs do not gain an autonomous existence. The premise of Gogol's story is that they can and do, but this is not sci-fi because nothing else changes and daily activities are not suspended. An anthropomorphized nose enters into business as usual. You can't keep a good nose down. The joy of this farcical vision lies in the way absurdity makes more absurdity out of normality. Now, the world in which a civil servant literally loses, loses face and identity is to a degree the world of Gogol's own marginal existence, anxiously projected onto his heroes. Gogol was marginal in all possible senses and desperately craved acceptance. He repeatedly became involved in situations that caused him to lose face. He came to St. Petersburg, the acknowledged center of cultural, particularly literary, Russian life from what was then the Ukraine or Little Russia. A low-ranking provincial, initially had great trouble in obtaining any position in St. Petersburg in the civil service. And when he finally succeeded, it was only at the lowest rank, with boring duties and paltry income. Uh, this image uh, by Alexander Ivanov uh, captures, the, the iconography of Gogol is very, very interesting. I'll say a bit more about Ivanov in a moment, but I think this is how Gogol looked um, at the apex of his fame, although at the time he was already in Rome. Uh, a little bit more about that in a moment. His first successful work, uh, Evenings on a Farm near Dikanka is set in Ukraine on the margins of the Russian Empire to which it belonged in the 19th century. The stories feature Ukrainian characters and use an imitation of the Ukrainian language in Russian, a very curious patois. Thanks to his literary success, Gogol eventually found high-ranking patrons. Through them, he gained access to decent service positions, first as a teacher of history at the Patriotic Institute, a school for daughters of fallen officers, and later as an adjunct professor of world history at St. Petersburg University. Characteristically, each experience was catastrophic. At the institute, he was dismissed because of his unreliable attendance. And at the university, he was dismissed technically because of reorganization, restructuring, but actually because the authorities were dismayed when they realized he had no academic qualifications. He knew nothing at all about history, but they had um, been to a dazzling lecture Gogol gave on world history and were bamboozled. 
Uh, in accepting the job, Gogol set himself up for failure when his ignorance was exposed. In 1836, he went abroad and spent about 12 years out of the 16 remaining years of his life outside Russia, mostly in Italy, mostly in, in Rome. And in fact, there's a plaque um, just, I think it's on the Via Sistina or the Via Gregoriana, just above the Spanish Steps, um, that marks the flat where he, he lived. Um, it was while he was in Europe that he wrote his most significant work, Dead Souls, in which he presented an image of the Russian provinces. He lived on the margins, wrote about the margins, and focused on marginal characters. This brings us to what can be called Gogol's moral marginality, his proclivity for lying, falsification, and pretense. Memoirists and biographers attest his penchant for fabrication, and his correspondence with his mother is quite a correspondence, I have to say, contains regular and elaborate lying. In a way, Gogol resembled his own character Klistakov, the hero of his play, The Inspector General, a fantasist, a pretender, and an inventor of stories, uh, who, among other things, claimed to be a close friend of Pushkin. As a result, it is notoriously difficult to write a credible biography of Gogol or to present his views with any degree of confidence. A remarkable lack of psychological consistency marks Gogol's image, which, which fluctuates, on the one hand, between that of a high-minded, sincere, and later in life, deeply religious individual. In the late 1840s, he began to make prophetic statements about Russia and Western civilization. And there's a famous painting by Ivanov, which is called The Manifestation of Christ to the People. And guess who stars in the role of Christ? <laughs> uh, it took Ivanov 20 years um, to, to paint this um, enormous canvas. And it's a kind of apotheosis of Gogol. But Gogol, on the other hand, was also thought of as a swindler and a con artist. And so his biography never really comes in to focus. He died in Rome, apparently of anorexia. Um, having failed to complete Dead Souls despite years of fervent labor. And having published the first volume, he promised to, to produce two more, but could not. He burned, at least he alleged, two drafts, first in June of 1845, and then again in February of 1852, ten days before his death. Doubts about even that act of creative suicide remain. He may not have written as much as he claimed uh, he had destroyed. And here you have, um, by the famous realist Ilya Repin, the self-immolation uh, of, of Gogol, who looks... Uh, Repin is a great psychological painter, and here he's imagining the state of turmoil in which Gogol finds himself on, in extremis. Yet, no one would say that Gogol's life as a writer was a failure. His works of fiction were instant classics. His style and use of language have great panache, invention, and comic hilarity. And here you can see um, so this is the monument to Nikolai Gogol in the Villa Borghese, um, and he's holding, um, well, I, he's holding a mask. Presumably it's comedy or tragedy, but of course the face is his. Uh, but you can see the laurel wreath. And so this is the, the monumental Gogol um, of the classic Russian tradition. He's a delightful and beguiling writer, and nowhere better seen than in his shorter fictions, such as the Petersburg Tales, as they're often called, which were written between the mid-1830s and the early 1840s. They include Nevsky Prospect, The Nose, The Overcoat, and Notes of a Madman. All take place in St. Petersburg and present state servants of various service ranks, functionaries. Yet nobody has ever been quite sure what they mean. This may because, be because the fiction pretends to be more realistic than it actually is. The 19th century was not ready for the manic absurdity of Gogol's world or his life. Contemporaries read Gogol's works as criticizing social injustice and defending the so-called little man. His own readers, often much teased in his fiction, saw him chiefly as a social satirist. Kavalyov's obsession with rank and codes of politeness are the object of lampooning, much as elsewhere Gogol cocks a snook at corruption. This earnest view, and these things are present in his work, but I think there's a tendency to make out of him a thoroughly earnest writer, which does not suit the Chagall-like phantasmagoria, partly inspired by folklore, partly similar to the fantastic world of an E.T.A. Hoffman. There is such a striking imbalance between the amount of romantic invention and realism as to undermine a portrait of Gogol as mainly a social critic of the imperial order. Now, we mustn't lose our own sense of fun or lose sight of Gogol's belief in laughter for its own sake as a great form of liberation. 
one might say that laughter was the mission of his art. Overall, in Gogol, it's a case of noses off rather than noises off. For Gogol is the nosiest of writers, sniffing noses, sniffling noses, twitching noses, sneezing noses, flow out of the pen of this comic genius and onto the page. But perhaps the page is a mirror and a self-portrait of Gogol himself, who was famously self-conscious and sensitive about his own nose. He even boasted about the dexterity of his nose in a letter to a young woman, not a traditional courting line. Um, Vladimir Nabokov uh, produced this wonderful description based on the impressions of people who knew Gogol. The book of writes that Gogol's, I quote, large and pointy nose was so long and elastic that in his youth he was able to touch the tip of his nose with his lower lip. His nose was the most distinctive and noticeable feature of his appearance. It was so long and sharp that it was able on its own, without the help of fingers, to penetrate into any snuff box, no matter how small, regardless of a lock and clasp. Gogol sees no contradiction between humor and enigma. We may never solve the puzzle, whatever it may be, in a story by Gogol, but we can still laugh at the joke. Must the joke have a serious message? The nose never convincingly explains the unexpected separation of the nose from Kavalyov's face, and its equally unexpected return. Does Major Kavalyov really lose his nose, or does he dream about it? If dogs can write letters as they do in Diary of a Madman, then why should a man not lose a nose and a nose pretend to be a man? Readers understandably want more than a joke, and there is no shortage of interpretations of Gogol's comic absurdity. Biographers have linked the tale to the theme of troubled sexuality in his work. Is the story a proto-Freudian piece of dream language, trying to get rid of repressed sexual desire, or is it rather a parable on the theme of life as an illusion? After all, the title of the story in Russian is Nos, and read, it, read back to front, it becomes Son, meaning dream. Does one wish to escape into reality or into the dream? By the turn of the 20th century, the modernist authors Dmitry Shostakovich admired had discovered a new Gogol. They liked the satirist, but not the realist, and especially admired a fabulous stylist and verbal magician. Early 20th century writers such as Mikhail Zoshenka, Mikhail Bulgakov, and Daniel Harms adored his anecdotal style and continued to build on the exuberant mix of linguistic play and outsized personalities that were Gogol's trademark. Dynamic, theatrical, inspired by Commedia dell'arte, Gogol's world teeters on the brink between reality and the supernatural, realism and romanticism, nonsense and moral profundity. Creative figures of Shostakovich's generation found a kindred spirit in Gogol because in their world of the late 1920s, all certainties were vanishing rapidly. They delighted in his method of dealing with radical uncertainty by letting language and images follow their own autonomous path, even to the point of reductio ad absurdum. The elevation of foolishness was a seemingly harmless veneer behind which to hide mounting anxiety an outlet for laughter. Words left Soviet reality behind, just as easily as a nose could jump off a face. And on the eve of the Great Terror, when Shostakovich was living in Leningrad, Gogol's surrealism was probably the best escape you could imagine. Thank you. Many thanks to Professor Andrew Kahn. Now, do please tweet us this evening with your thoughts and any questions as we go through. That's hashtag... ROH knows. It would be wonderful to hear from you. But now, it's my great pleasure to welcome to the stage two members of the cast. Martin Winkler, who has the task of playing the noseless Major Kovalyov, and Rosie Aldridge, who performs the rather feisty role of Praskovya Osipovna and the pretzel seller. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Martin and Rosie. Hello. Welcome, Martin. Welcome, Hello. Rosie. Hello. So, we are in week four of rehearsals in the studio. How's it going? Wonderful. <laughs> Rosie. Rosie, how's it going for you? <laughs> We're having a lot of fun. Yes, it's it sounds like you have been. Yeah, rather too much fun, really. I oh, think. That, that also yeah. sounds good. <laughs> um, so, could you tell me about your characters in the piece? Could you tell me about who you're, who you're playing? Martin. Okay. <clears throat> uh, Kovalyov is a weird, crazy, uh, 
further questions maybe to the uh, director, Barry Koski. Uh, he's a strange things happen to him and he walks up and, and he's, he's going mad and, and trying to, oh God, no, it's really difficult to explain. It's an up and down through all things can happen to you, uh, a, a sweating journey through, through hell and, and heaven, expectations, uh, Humiliation, so it's a heavy torturing. <laughs> yes, it's everything. So you it's, really go through a roller coaster yes, of emotions. Uh, yes, you can. It's a diving in. I don't know, to all all kind of of, of uh, mankind uh, emotions and and and. Yeah. So we dig really deep with the emotional yes. kind of landscape and scale of of, of what you're going yes, through. Yes, thank is. you. What about yourself? Mm. Um, I play two uh, rather bonkers women. Um, the first uh, uh, opens the show, and um, uh, Praskovia Osipovna, who is the barber's wife, so I'm Sir John Tomlinson's wife. Um, you know, it's a hardship. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and uh, so I do a lot of uh, very violent bread making, um, and uh, then I find uh, this 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 nose in the dough, and um, needless to say, I'm I'm not very happy about it. It's not ideal, is it? it it's not <laughs> ideal, and I make my feelings uh, known very, very, very clearly and emphatically. Um, so it's she has a real, real screaming fit um, uh, with a rolling pin. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and you are playing another character. I am playing as well, another character as well. Yes, um, I'm playing the pretzel vendor. Um, traditionally, the pretzel vendor. Although I'm not going to give too much away, uh, yes. but in our production, uh, she's not selling pretzels. <laughs> so okay. I'm we'll not going to say there. any <laughs> more. Very good. Now I hear that there are 80 named roles in this production. That's quite a lot. Have you managed to remember who's playing who as we go through? No. no. <laughs> you weave through this together. <laughs> so yes. is this the first time you've come across the piece as, as you're working on it now? Have you worked on the piece before or have you... No. Very first time. Absolutely. First time. Yeah. And, and so the first time... So um, also we're, le we're learning it in English, so as yes. opposed to the original Russian. And a new translation, I hear, by yes. David Powley. How Fantastic. are you enjoying working with that English text? Well, you probably have a very different <laughs> thing, yeah. I'm Austrian, so for me it's a rather hard job to keep this British, um, you know, right pronunciation and the and everything else. So I'm rather <laughs> obsessed with uh, the and, and, you know, wounded, everything. So we've given you a task, haven't we? Yes, <laughs> yes, it's and part of the What deal. about yourself for the, for the play with the text? Well, I'm, I'm loving it, actually, because I think that um, it's a fantastic translation. And I think with a piece like this, which is not necessarily hugely accessible initially, I think actually for British audiences, I think it's a really good idea. I think it's a fantastic British translation, idea. an English translation. Thank you. And um, it's, it's, yeah, it's exciting. And how do you think Shostakovich enjoyed placing the use of text? I mean, the, the scoring that is written for you, there's a lot of very hard and fast text work mm. and lots of lyrical long lines as well. I mean, he asked a lot of you. What do you think he's asking you to do with the text? You're like, uh, <laughs> yes, oh, right, I'll OK. Um, <laughs> yes, I don't get many uh, lyrical legato lines in my music, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> but however, um, it's, it's absolutely perfectly written um, because it's so easy with, I mean, it's incredibly difficult music, um, incredibly difficult music. It's been a huge challenge. But actually, the way he writes is very conversational in parts. Mm -hmm. Um, and it makes it very, very easy to express the emotion that is needed at the time. It's a little bit, I don't know if you agree, but a little bit like Richard Strauss in that actually it's all there for you. So if you sing the music just as Shostakovich wrote, then you are emoting appropriately. So actually yeah. it's, it's very, very, very useful for the characterization and the drama as well. Excellent. So he's really dramatically supporting you with how he, he supports the text. Um, the vocal and dramatic demands of the role that you've started to talk about at the beginning. How did you start to learn this piece, even before you got into the rehearsal room? How long does it take to get a piece like this learnt before you even mm. step into the space to be directed? Mm. Uh, it's a long investment, I think, yes. yes. Um, yeah, three, four months. Mm. 
in your daily, uh, daily studying, work. daily work, yeah, of course. Uh, the pitches are not, uh, it's not um, harmony, it's, you, it changes, it's very high, it's mm. low, it, it's unbelievable ryth rhythmic, uh, rhythmic changes, so uh, first I stared at it and it was... Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> what to do now? Well, do, losing my brain or my nose, it's, it was the same. <laughs> uh, I was, uh, it was outstanding and, and, and even the, the, the fast text is Sometimes it's crazy, it's hysterical, overwhelming. It bursts out of my mouth and, and, and it's high. And it, <laughs> it kept, it kept everything together. And, so it's put you through the ringer. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I climbed a lot of mountains in Austria in, in the summertime <laughs> to get fit for my beloved uh, staging director, Barry, uh, because I know he would use it. Thank you very much. So how have you enjoyed creating it in the room? So we've talked about how we've learned it before we got to the room. How have you enjoyed creating this with Barry and with Ingo? Oh, it's, uh, I'm not just saying this because he's here. No, it's... But... Um, <laughs> it's not the only reason. Yeah. No, but it's... no, it, seriously, it's been such a joy. And I felt yes. that when I was learning this music, it was a very lonely demanding, stressful, traumatic time. It's just <laughs> so hard. And actually, um, coming into the rehearsal room and being, working with Barry and being part of a team, mm. we've just, it's been so enjoyable. And it's a real team piece and yes. we have a fantastic cast. Yes. And we, we really do all love each other very much and work hard together. And that's what I think has been so nice, yeah. isn't it? We sweat together. We do. We really, really do sweat. There's a lot of team sweat. There's a lot of team sweat. It's an unbelievable team, really. It's, yeah. it's perfect casted, and and we have with Barry. It's it's a big joy. Yes, although I'm Austrian and he has some open things with Austrians. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> oh, but uh, that's on. okay. Yeah, yeah I, I have to. <laughs> I have to suffer from my whole nation. Well, uh, thank good. you very much for that. <laughs> and uh, I'll, uh, no, it's, it's inspiring. He's brilliant, and and you c I hope everybody's coming. And it's no, it's really, it's very. It's he's picky. He, he he looks at every every movement and every and every single uh, mimic uh, or mimic grief mm -hmm. in the face or. Mm. If the text if the is wrong, he kills me, and that's just you know, turning into a therapy a lot session. Of, uh, <laughs> so, yeah. so do you have at the moment? I know we're still in week four of the studio, and we haven't gone to stage yet. But is there a particular musical highlight that you've really enjoyed investigating as you've put this piece together? Oh wow! Wow, that's quite a difficult question. Very difficult. Oh. A favourite scene, <laughs> or, or or a scene that even terrifies you? All of it. <laughs> yeah, it's actually, it's, it's, it's really hard to, to pick out something yes. because it all feels, there's some beautiful moments yes. um, which I didn't really realise mm. because when I was working on it, you know, it felt all very aggressive and attacker and, and actually uh, the joy for me has been watching some of, there's a scene in the cathedral um, to hear some of the, the beauty and the almost chorale-like singing from the chorus. The chorus, I have to say, are just astounding and are really, really singing it fantastically. That is an extraordinary yeah. moment in the cathedral there, isn't oh, it? The yes, it's unbelievably it's beautiful. Absolutely. Yeah, they're singing. It's are they, they're, honestly, it's wow. really, really breathtaking. And um, so actually, probably, yeah, for me, that's been a real highlight. Yes. Because it's quite a... There's, and, and, and the stillness, the moments of stillness in the piece really stick out for me mm. because they're really... Barry has made those very, very important and actually, we really empathise with your character, don't we? And we really feel for him, yeah. as opposed to him being just a caricature, which I think is really clever. Yeah. So there's the investment yes. of, the, of the honesty, of, of the truth of the character yes. as well. Yes. So you're following, and yes. I suppose you do have to have moments where you, you've got to feel for him. It's yes. a real journey that you're going on. Yes. And we, we're with you for, it, it's, it's quite a, a long stretch. It runs for one, one hour and yeah. 45, I think, without mm. any intervals. It's a, a long journey that we, yes. we grab yeah. on from the beginning and follow you with. It's a thunderstorm, yes. it's a tornado, yeah. and, and there's some moments of stillness, uh, yeah. really beautiful. Yes. And, and, and then I, uh, gotta, 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 I, I go through the piece every, every time, and Barry says, 
piano, you need to sometimes relax a, bit relax a little bit, and that's wonderful too. Mm, mm. So for those people who've, who've not heard of the piece, have, have no insight yet into what this is about, why should they come to see and hear this piece? Rosalie. Okay. Well, it's, it's, it's probably the closest you're going to get to a legal high, actually, I would think. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it, you're, uh, I think it's... I really do hope that people come and see this um, because I understand why uh, it could be interpreted as being challenging. However, I think it's going... To, I'm going to stick my neck out and say I think it's going to be an extraordinary production. Well, there's a great buzz around the there house is a about great, it. There is a great buzz about it. Um, and I think that... Um, the, the, key, the key to me, because I was trying to analyse this piece and understand it, and what, what Barry, I think, has done, captured so well is that actually trying to give it layers and trying to understand it and trying to take it apart it, it is not necessarily what it's about. Mm. It is actually this surrealist nightmare, and if you take it thus, you know, then it, it makes a weird sort of sense. So I hope people come and just enjoy not making sense of something <laughs> and yes. just being in this mad world. Um, and, and also, um, we must mention the dancers. Yes. There's just the most extraordinary choreography um, Otto, our choreographer, I can't remember his surname. That's Austrian. Really terrible. Ah. <laughs> he is, oh, the choreography, and the, we have ten dancers, and it's like West Side Story meets Tribal meets... It's so exciting. So I think yes. this, this piece has everything, and I think you'd be mad not to come and see yes. it. Yes. Well, I mean, we can't no, no. ask and for that. Barry brought everything together. It's really it's perfect, and, and uh, it's... Uh, it's a yeah. So we should just dive headfirst in and mm. swim in the glory of this piece. Absolutely. Fantastic. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, my greatest thanks to Martin Winkler and Rosie Aldridge. It's been wonderful to talk to you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>now to all of our audience members who've joined us this evening online do please tweet us with any questions thoughts or comments using hashtag roh knows now ingo metzmacher conductor of the nose is unable to join us this evening but it is my great pleasure to welcome head of music the royal opera david cyrus <laughs> david good evening thank you for joining us now how are you enjoying working on this piece a lot, um, a though I must say, I, I, I've been around this place a long time and I thought I needed to be taken out of my comfort zone a bit, and I achieved that aim rather more extremely than I thought I was going to. <laughs> it's a very difficult piece to play. I, I've really been stretched by, by the rehearsals I've played so, so far. It's because it's illogical. I mean, it, it, one can f imagine harder scores, but this simply doesn't fulfil any of the criteria, the other music around that period, mm. it seems to me, which, um, which has its own difficulties but logic it's not serial it's not expressionist I don't, I, I don't know what it is it's not even sort of bitonal in the manner of, of Bartok you can say what this piece isn't it's rather harder to say what it actually is <laughs> but, but what it is is quite clearly the inventiveness of a young man just suddenly playing with you know the 12 notes of the scale with a pretty conventional orchestra except for the huge percussion department um, and um, I guess some virtuoso singers I mean he does take particular tenor voice to mm. very high Tessitura. And he was 21 when he yeah. wrote this. He, it was written over two years, wasn't it? 1927 to 28. Right. 21 years of age. I mean, it puts me in mind of something like Powder Her Face by Thomas Addis. It's the same feeling of this brilliant young fellow just having a good time. Mm. I, mean, it's the, I mean, the orchestral scoring, it seems to me like a celebration of an orchestra. The way he writes for percussion, wind, brass, strings, he absolutely invests in every section and goes crazy for them. They, and everybody has very difficult music to play. Mm. It is quite interesting. I mean, he wrote it, I think, for a really quite a smallish pit band. I mean, the, 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 you can't negotiate it. He says nine percussion, we've got 12. Um, the strings are negotiable. We're playing quite a big number of strings because it's a big house and it needs that sound. Mm. And there are moments, in, including one of the scenes we're going to, to, to briefly play, where the string writing is wonderful. It's, it's a, f a fugue for the doctor's scene. And that takes you into the string writing of, of later Shostakovich, I mean, way beyond what he was writing at this particular period. It takes you into the string quartets, really, that sort of thing. But, I mean, what is, to me, quite interesting is that he wrote for a pit band. He wrote for a clarinet player who could play an E-flat clarinet and regular clarinet and a bass clarinet. Now, in our orchestra, those players, they can do that, but it's not what they normally do. So we, I'm afraid, are not um, playing with one player. We're having three players. Wow. 
Um, I mean, I think we'll get you know fantastic virtuoso playing for people who are playing in instruments that they're used to playing. I, I, as I say, they all of them could undoubtedly play all three parts as Shostakovich meant, but there's no reason to go down that austere route because we have them in the company and they're already being paid. <laughs> <laughs> so this really is a huge cast then, isn't it? So it's, it's, it's a huge... I mean, there, there, are, there are 40 the strings, actually, and, right. say, and there's 12 percussion. OK, thank you. So could you tell us... You, you mentioned the fugal nature of the Doctor scene, and that really does take us into a very surreal zone, and we'll, we'll be hearing that later on. Tell me a, a, a little more about the other musical styles that we come across as we work through the piece. Well, we're going to hear three scenes, and the first scene is, in a way, like an exploration of what music and sound is about. It's a guy waking up and the sounds are incoherent, and they're incoherent from the voice and they're incoherent from the orchestra. A lot of sliding and rasping and belching and you know, anything that a trombone can do, it'll do. Um, th we have then a, a second scene which is much more serious um, when, I, when I, I suppose we're expected to feel the pathos of the guy's situation, having lost his nose. But I'm worried, I must say, in this period, in this style, to go down the road of pathos, I mean, it, I don't know enough about Brecht, but I mean, Meyerholt, who was the major figure at this period, taught Brecht. We're, I, I don't think we're, we're in the area of Puccini. I'm not sure how much we are supposed to feel sorry for this guy having lost his nose. That's the problem I've got, and I should have asked Barry about this before I came in the room. Sorry for that. <laughs> anyway, but um, I mean, we're going into, there's a, there's a quasi puccini ish lyrical mm. scene, and then we have this scene with the doctor, which has a resonance because Berg's Wozniak had just been performed um, in Russia and, and Shostakovich had seen it. Um, and there's a doctor scene there, but it's, it's not really like the, the Berg scene. This is in a way drier. Um, it seems quite clinical in the strain. I mean, we go through quite so. a few musical zones in that scene, actually. Well, I, that's right. I mean, I, just when you think you've mastered one page, you turn the page and find that the logic that you saw you through there off. won't see you to the next page. But isn't that the glory of the piece, as yeah. you kind of drop into this dream world and the chaos ensues? Yeah. You get used to one sound, and then he catapults you into another zone. Yeah, and, it's and brilliant. I mean, it's so fascinating. I mean, you, your interest is held every second. Mm. I mean, those moments you talked about, the, the moments, uh, the, almost like the aria moments, those are in such a different zone sure. to it, like the interludes which kind of drive us through the story. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's wonderful because... He asks a lot of your brain as you go through this piece, and there are moments where he just allows you to stop and, and re-engage in a different way, and I think that has been threaded through so, so mm -hmm. cleverly. Um, OK, so I think we should listen to the quite famous percussion uh, intermezzo. This intermezzo follows on from scenes where Ivan the barber has <laughs> discovered the nose in his freshly baked loaf of bread, has been chased out of the house by his wife to get rid of it, has dropped the nose into the river from a bridge, but whilst doing so has been clocked by a police inspector. Shall we have a listen to that percussion intermezzo now? Do you want to go straight into the next scene? I think we're just going to have a listen. I mean, if that isn't a descent into chaos, I don't know what is. Could you tell me a little bit about that spicy section we've just heard? I'm not sure it's a descent into chaos. I think it's a descent into sort of Soviet Nibelheim. 
I mean, I, I don't think he was setting out to write p parody. I mm. mean, he might have been had an eye on, on Wagner at, at, that, at that moment. It, that, that, that's what gets to my head. But I mean, you know, I think it's a, it's a free country. Anybody can make of it what, what he pleases. But it's virtuoso and, and it, it provides an unbelievable stimulus for dance. Yes, it certainly does. And it must be extraordinary to play and to, to lead something like that. Now, the percussion interlude, which we've just heard, then leads directly to our second meeting uh, with Major Kovalyov, who is rather slowly and indulgently waking up. He shortly to discover, however, that his nose is missing. Ladies and gentlemen, an advance warning, colourful language to follow. Performing this scene, please welcome baritone Grant Doyle. happened my nose is not there where has it gone some water and a mirror nothing no nose there vanished and gone David, you talked about the trombones creating all sorts of noises. Can you tell me about the opening sound world of the, the extract we've just heard? Is that indicated entirely by Shostakovich? Has he really indicated exactly how he, he wants those waking up noises to come out? Is that all in the score? Or is that created between conductor, performer, director? A lot's given, but I must say it's up to the artists themselves. I mean, uh, exactly how you interpret brrr is up to you. I mean, you, you can do a brrr without tone, or you can put it onto, onto a note, and, you know, there's a lot, a lot of options and it'll probably be different every night. Well, it was wonderfully performed. Thank you very, very much. Now, this next scene, as we talked about earlier, is almost like an aria in form. Kov Kovalyov has just returned from a visit to the newspaper office, where his attempt to place an advert for the return of his missing nose has been largely unsuccessful. And we hear him pour out his heart, bemoaning, what have I done to deserve such a cruel mutilation? Let's hear again from Grant and David. Thank you. Oh, your legs, 
Just a clown. Thank you very much. That wonderful quote. But a noseless man is somehow not a man, less than a dog or a worm, nothing at all. Is this aria the crux of the piece? Is this the heart? Is this the core of the piece, do you think? It's an emotional core in, 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 in the most conventional operatic way. I have no idea whether that's the core of the, the, this, the aesthetic of this piece. I suspect it may not be. Uh -huh, we shall see. It certainly gives us a little pocket into a dark moment where he really investigates the horror of what's happened. And with all the calamity that musically occurs around it, it's a moment where we can all settle together. Thank you very much, Grant. Our final performance is the wonderful and clinically bizarre scene that we talked about earlier, the doctor scene, in which the desperate Kovalyov calls upon the doctor as his final hope and potential saviour from his current predicament. Please welcome bass Alan Ewing, who will join David and Grant Doyle to perform this scene. Welcome. <laughs> Oh, your other body parts 
are in their old places. The rest does not concern you. That is in place. Yes, all right. Keep calm. Sit down. Turn your head sideways. Oh, nothing. Right, please, carefully, a little more. Hold it there. Yes. No! Oh! Mm. No, impossible. What? My advice is stay as you are now. Make matters worse. Much more. Sir, I beseech you, you must cure me. Of course, we could try to glue it, well it. But I have to warn you, it may not look natural. Stick it any which way. If it is a mess that is not so important, just fix it as firmly as you can. I can even hold it when things get critical anyway. I never go dancing, so I do not risk dislodging it by making some kind of false movement. I beg you, as to my gratitude, you can be confident I will pay you as much as is possible. Doctor, I give you all my savings. Let's be quite clear. I don't try to take advantage of patience. That is against my philosophy and the ethics of my profession. Frankly, if I do accept money, that is just out of courtesy, as I do not wish to. Appear to be rude, so trust me, I'll put your nose in its place. But first I have to warn you on the word of a friend and a tried and trusted physician. It will look worse than it looks at the moment. Why not leave the matter in the hands of Mother Nature? Clean the spot very frequently with water. And you will soon get used to your shape. For a man without a nose learns to like how he is. Just as much as when his face was complete. And as for your nose, I recommend that you seal it in a jar of spirit. Even better, add a shot of vodka, just a spoonful mixed with a lukewarm vinegar. And with luck, you'll get quite a decent price for such a famous specimen. I might be interested myself if the price was just right and not outrageous. No, no, it is not up for sale. I'd rather allow it to rot. I am sorry. I was only... Trying to help you, but it's hopeless. I can assure you, at all times, of my best intentions. Go, go, go on in your place, you nose.
Ladies and gentlemen, my greatest thanks to Royal Opera Head of Music, David Cyrus, Grant Doyle and Alan Ewing. And now I'm thrilled to introduce you to the director of our new production, Of the Nose, Barry Kosky. <laughs> Barry, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Pleasure. So this is your debut at the Royal Opera House. Yes, my first and maybe last time. <laughs> <laughs> Unlikely so far. But what, how did it come by that you chose this piece? Did you get to choose yes, this I piece? Did. Um, Kasper uh, asked me, like, I think four years ago, when he just, just almost, no, no, I don't even think it was five years, which is when he first started. Mm. Um, and I said, great, I'd love to come and do a show. I said, but there are a number of conditions. Good lad. And the conditions were that, firstly, it was a non-repertoire piece. Okay. So I said, I think um, I don't want to make my Royal Opera House debut with a Mozart or a Wagner or a Strauss or a Puccini. Um, because there's just too much pressure for a director to p do those pieces here in this house as right. your first production. Um, and secondly, I said I want a piece which um, is an ensemble piece mm -hmm. that has the best singers that we can get in the world, but not necessarily stars, because then it means that everyone can be here for the seven weeks of rehearsal, and I don't have the problem because they have to fly off to Salzburg or <laughs> Paris or whatever to do concerts or other gigs or phone in sick for three weeks or send their understudies or whatever happens in some <laughs> other houses. Um, Obviously and, not. Um, and I said that was a condition, uh, the second condition. And um, I said the third condition was a piece that what Covent Garden had ever done. Well, so those three choice. were my conditions, and Casper said, "Oh, great!" And I, he knew that I had an idea. He said, "So, what do you want to do?" And yes. I said, "The notes." So, so <laughs> <laughs> when did you first come across the piece? Uh, when I was at university, at Melbourne University, I was studying music history, and um, I was started, I had started to direct opera mm. at Melbourne University, um, and I was searching for pieces to do. Mm -hmm. um, I had done started off with Monteverdi and with Orfeo, and then I had done La Calisto by Cavalli, and I thought, okay, enough with the Baroque. I need another piece. So yes. I went, looked around the music uh, library. I knew I loved Shostakovich since I was a teenager. Um, and um, I actually had known about Lady Mac listened to Lady Macbeth before I listened to The Nose. And, um, and I found the score. And of course, it was impossible to do at Melbourne University. But um, I looked at it and went, wow. And actually, through that, I then started to read Gogol because I, mm. I actually, actually hadn't read Gogol before. Aha, uh -huh, so you, it, Gogol came after the... Yeah, I, I, was, wow. I, was, I was obsessed with, with, with Kafka when I was a teenager. That, mm. was, that was my man, um, my go-to man. Go-to um, man. For teenage... <laughs> um, <laughs> teenage Jewish gay angst in Melbourne. Um, <laughs> And, um, and so I, that was my go-to man. And then I discovered Gogol, who then became sort of my second go-to man. Second um, body. Yeah, yeah. So why do you think this piece is so rarely performed? Thank you for bringing it here, by the way. Uh, well, I mean, this is, I mean, David's already spoken about this, the technical demands and use of the <laughs> casting. I mean, there's nearly 80 named roles. Mm. So you have to cast it with 33, I think, 33 soloists who, who double. Yeah or triple, or in some cases, I don't know what you call, five roles. Um, and then you have the chorus, um, and then in our case we have dancers the also, and a tap dancing boy, which we'll get onto in a moment, I'm oh, sure. Goodness. Um, <laughs> and, um, and so that it becomes a very exp sheer, sheer exp logistically expensive, yes. and most opera houses can't afford to do it. It's very surprising that Covent Garden um, said yes to it, because you could only really do this piece if you have a very large ensemble, mm. and, and, and Covent Garden have to bring that ensemble in. So it's, 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 it's logistically very complicated. Secondly, Shostakovich makes a director's life a fabulous nightmare, because <laughs> he, 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 he is very cinematic in how he deals with the action. So he'll have an interlude or a scene, and then it's cut straight into the next scene, and there's no, there's no um, uh, time uh, in the score to, to, to get sort of scene changes, or he'll cut in the middle of a scene. It's very cinematic in that mm. respect. So, of course, that, that's not a problem for me. That's a wonderful challenge. Yes, it's um, a challenge. And I think the third thing is that the piece is very, very, very hard to not just sing and perform, but to sort of to sell. Um, I mean, I've seen four productions of the piece. Um, the most famous one has been the last few years, w William Kentridge, who is a genius animator, um, did a piece in New York um, I did a version in New York, which was very constructivist orientated and very con uh, con uh, came out of his wonderful animation world. But, but for me, it was, it was very unemotional and um, it didn't go into the psychological depth of the, of the character that I think you need 
to make the audience care and be interested in this sort of very sad, weird clown, which he mm. is. I mean, he sings, you know, I'm, I'm nothing but a clown, and he is a Russian clown, which means that you really have to find a performer that can do that because all the other characters, it's, it's Alice in Wonderland, you know, that he meets all these other characters, but it's the Mad Hatter's Tea Party and it's the Queen, of the, but they, they, they're, they're not uh, psychologically complex characters mm. and he meets them because they confront him in some way or, or, or in Alice's case, confront her in some way, but it's really the major character. Now, the difference between something like Alice in Wonderland and Kovalov in uh, The Nose is that Alice is, an, is a is quite emotionally cut off and protective of herself, whereas Kovalov is the exact opposite. As we've seen one of those performances yeah, earlier. And, 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 and that's why you need someone, and that's why I, I persuaded, because there were some tense discussions at the beginning about the casting that we bring over Martin from um, um, Vienna, because um, I'd worked with Martin already in Berlin yes. um, doing Le Grand Macabre, and I said there is actually only one person in the world that can play this role in my production. Casper, and um, um, and um, and there was discussions. They they knew Martin's work, but they said, "Oh, you know, maybe we need a name." You know, and I said, "No, no, no. There's, it's 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 we do it with Martin, or we don't do it all." So I, I, I we, you're you're going to see an extraordinary performance. And he's uh, he's on a lot. Yeah, he's it's on. His, I think he just has a two glasses of water sort of breaks State, where he quickly wow. can can run off. But I think the thing is that also the piece has so many challenges, not just musically, but um, scenically and psychologically, it's, it's very, very hard. But what I want to say was that the productions that I've seen mm. don't... He, he is on face level a very unsympathetic man. <laughs> he's, he's a dandy, he's obsessed with social status, mm. he's, he talks his vain, he talks endlessly about himself, he's ambitious, he's dirty, he smells, even though he talks to everyone, he talks to says the barber time, your hand Accuses smells, elsewhere. but you go yes. actually that you know, you're the one that smells. So on face value, he's this sort of, you know, stinky, herring stained, onion stained, sort of Russian grotesque sort of uh, official. And you have to make that man into a, not, not necessarily likable, but understandable, and then be shocked that you actually feel something for him. Um, because his predicament is a sort of universal predicament, which is, you know, what would it be like if you didn't have a nose? Loss, you know? yes. How do you So it's about that? fear and loss. And, of course, they're the two great motivators for a lot of drama. So Absolutely. It's, it's, it's there in the piece. And just having heard what we heard earlier, just hearing it in English, was that a very strong choice that you no, wanted to hear absolutely. it? No, no, we said, uh, I said to Casper initially, it must be done in English because mm. it's a conversation piece. And, mm. look, you know, I come from now an opera house in Berlin where we've gone back to original language since mm. I've been running it. So we've gone from an all-German house like the ENO mm. um, to now going back into... Um, original language for most productions. And my, 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 my theory is, look, I don't believe in dogma of any sort. So I don't believe in an opera house that says we do everything in original mm. and an opera house who says we do everything in the language of the audience. The I mixture. think you have to mix them. Yeah. I think the 21st century, is, and, and it's the technology is there. And I think that you have to say, I don't want to hear Eugene Onegin in anything but Russian. I don't want to hear it in English, and I certainly don't want to hear it in German. And I don't want to hear Pelleas and Melisande in English or, or, or German. And I certainly don't want to hear not one single note of Italian opera in English, because it just all turns into Gilbert and Sullivan. So, <laughs> but, but I do want to hear the nose in English, because the text is so fabulous, and it's very important that the audience, even if you don't understand everything, and there are parts of Shostakovich basically writes music which is impossible to understand. I mean, Martin, who, who's not an English speaker, um, has to perform... Uh, s some passages that are so fast that even in Russian, I'm sure, a Russian audience, if you said, stop, what, what? did he just <laughs> say then? That it would just be literally, it just comes across, and I think that that's this sort of great, that's part of the piece. It's an omni... 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 Oh. Oh, no. Oh, no. It's a no. It's a no. I can't find it either. <laughs> Omniopathic... What was I trying to say? On a matter of pay. Australians. Too difficult for Australians. Um, <laughs> So, and so that, that, that's part of it, and, um, but it's so very important. And you get great jokes. I mean, I've deliberately made sure that they're taking the joke lines off the surtitles. So we are forced to listen. Because of, of a performer and a director seeing the line 
before uh, the audience reacting before they've actually sung it, which happens in, unfortunately, that's the, one of the bad sides of effects of uh, surtitles. But we have a marvellous team here. <laughs> um, but, so you've talked about how it's kind of cinematic and he drops you from space to space. How have you entered that design world? How, how I mean, he, the city, I mean, the, 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 the story itself is saturated in city life, all the different spaces, the cathedral, the apartment, the bedroom, the newspaper office. How do you begin to put that in one space? Well, firstly, I'm, I work with a team of different designers. This <laughs> production is designed by um, one of my wonderful collaborators, Klaus Grunberg, who mm. also does the lighting. And, um, you know, my designers and I work on spaces. I didn't, we, uh, you're never going to get St. Petersburg in my show anyway. You're never going to get a literal representation of the theatre. It's impossible to put the city on the stage in a way that you would do brilliantly in a film, mm. you know, where you can put a city on the stage. So the last thing you want is to say, we're putting the city on stage and everything's rolling around on wheels and it all looks like a city. A city. That's not the point. The point is that you have to feel that it's the city of the lead character. So you have to feel what it's like for him to go through it. So it's private spaces mm. and there's public spaces, but they're just spaces. And so, um, like most of my productions, the design is in fact very, very simple. Oh. Um, and that's inhabited by the complexity of the performance. Because to me, you know, the ancient Greeks got it absolutely right. And that the center, not just the motor, of the of a performance, but the absolute resonating chamber uh, of a piece must be uh, initiated by the performer, mm. um, and so everything that has meaning in the piece must come from the performer's body and the performer's voice in opera, and not from big bits of show and tell. Sh show and tell, because because that's easy. Any director and a vaguely talented designer can sit with a computer nowadays and put together, you know, colour and movement. But that's not what theatre is for me, and certainly I don't believe that in the case of this piece, it's served by doing that. So through this sort of changing space, which has a number of elements in it, mm. but very simple elements, we create rooms, spaces, nightmarish situations through the performer costumes and light, um, and it, it becomes more nightmarish because the audience are allowed to associate. And, mm. you know, I'm not there to say to an audience, this is what you should feel, and this is what it means. I'm there to establish a, a series of associations that, although I'm very clear what I'd like, um, uh, you know, art is about resonating meaning. Mm. And it's very important in opera that we celebrate the ridiculousness of the unrealness of opera. You know, the truth comes through the formal ritual of opera and through the fakeness of it. That's how the truth emerges. There's more truth in a 10-minute death aria than there is in, uh, you know, someone realistically dying on stage. You know, that's what opera is about. And, and I'm a person that believes very much in you celebrate opera by being as unliteral and unnaturalistic as you possibly can. And through that, you get the truth. That we heard earlier, actually, about the title of Nosh Son. So the nose dream. So you, you must have, it sounds like you've been drawn quite strongly yeah, by the dream it. I mean, world. I mean, Gogol's genius is to, he was originally going to call it Son. Dream. And, and it was called yes. Dream. That was the original short story. Mm. And then he went, no, I'll just switch that round. And I don't think anything happens by accident in Gogol's work. So I think that was very, very clear. But the sheer nature of how he writes, um, and your very, um, very informed professor was talking about this, um, that um, you know, the sheer way in which he puts together these fragments, which on, on face value don't make any sense, begins to convey meaning. And it's mm. no surprise that who was Kafka's favourite writer? Gogol. Ah, uh, there we are. So it's like, you know, and you know, Kafka, Ka, Kovalov. Don't tell me that somewhere along Kafka's youth, the, 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 that Kovalov and the nose and the overcoat didn't inspire him for, for K in, in the trial. It's, it's, it's there, it's amazing. So it's all yeah, yeah. led it's and... Like, and we talked about Wozzeck, um, Shostakovich then heard, so Shostakovich then heard Wozzeck, I think a year before he started writing mm. the piece in St. Petersburg, and, and, and you go, wow, that's like a very strange homage to Alban Berg in the piece too. There, also in the interludes and how, yeah, how, yeah, how the, kind of I mean, drives even the piece sounds nothing like Alban Berg, no. but you go, ooh, okay, so you see this incredible meeting in the, in, the, in the piece between two geniuses, of the genius of Gogol from the 19th century and then the genius of Shostakovich from the 20th century. And we decided very early on that I didn't, if you were doing the piece in the 21st century, I wouldn't do an opera, I'd do a film. 
Right. And you would have him going on eBay to find who's selling his nose, and you would have... <laughs> you, would, you would use all the wonderful um, things about... And you'd do a great film. But the, the, the logic of Gogol in the way he's written and Shostakovich's score makes no sense in grafting then a 21st century aesthetic on it. Mm. I also think that it's not a constructivist piece, so it makes no sense for me to put it in the 1920s because even though Shostakovich was writing it, it's not a constructivist score. It's not a score of, of machines and, 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 and collage. It's a, a score with circus and review and vaudeville and parody and all these things. And I don't think it's a score that has anything to do with those great collages of, 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 of Russian film and visual art at the time. What it has is you have to go back to Gogol and you have to go back to a dirty, grubby, filthy, funny, weird, a world that, you know, Dickens is, is just, 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 you know, kindergarten just compared. Just scratching the surface. You know, the, so the grubbiness of Dickens is nowhere near as grubby as Gogol's grubby. Um, he gives better grubby. And this is where we took the inspiration. So we designed a very sort of cold, monumental set, which looks yes, like a theatre ah. or a space. Um, and what you don't see in these costumes is that the entire costumes are all 19th century. So you get sort of in a way that the, the, the set is giving you the 20, 20th century of the world of Shostakovich's yes. music and the costumes, which you don't see, because this was done a year before we worked on the costumes with Ricky uh -huh. Schiff, you don't see the wonderful 19th century shabby world. But here you see the strange, this is just one scene, uh, and there's this series of tables that get smaller and bigger and more nightmarish, you know, so that there's these platforms. It looks like a circus, it looks like a medical Ah, oh, look at the, yes, I see. Um, this becomes one scene, for example, you will see the people, I, I, won't, I won't spot it, but these tables are actually all bicycles, they're like rickshaws. So they're driven around And the they're space, driven around. They? So oh. we, we sort of have a rickshaw restaurant and all these light fittings are on wheels. So to give a sense of the, you know, one thing about St. Petersburg in the 19th century was always these lights on the street. Mm. So by having just poles with um, light bulbs and tables with light bulbs and having this moved around by sort of people on the stage, you get this sense of what could be a dreamed ritual of the city without putting a big painted backdrop of St. Petersburg. No, that does everything, it. doesn't it? So, um, I mean, I think through? I said to the, I said to the Comic Garden, you know, these rickshaws are so fabulous, they should probably, after the production, be sort of using them around for tourism around <laughs> the Comic Garden. <laughs> a dual outside. purpose. Yeah. What, what are we looking through? What is do you that, mean? Uh, is that an iris? Oh, uh, kind oh of yes, this, is an, uh, this opens and shuts, the sort of iris, which gives a sort of, sort of hole, a sense of, 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 of a cavity. You know, so, I mean, so much of the opera has a sort of sexual element, you know. Yes. Uh, in terms of, you can't, I mean, the, the nose and what that nose represents is made lots of jokes of in the text. And, and I, don't, I didn't want to say to the audience, yeah, the nose is a substitute penis, ha, 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 ha. It's quite clear that that could be a reading of it. But the castration imagery um, and the castration theme of the opera uh, is very, very clear. Mm. And so this sort of idea of the sort of absence of the nose with only having a sort of hole there is also, it's also a very, it's also, it's a sort of double sexual image of man and woman. So you're playing on a lot of very different sort of weird levels. And that sort of somehow gives a sort of, it's the iris of a camera. And also the absence of the, the It's the absence itself. of the nose. And this opens up. Here's one scene, for example, we, ha we get a little bed. And so it really, it's a sort of, it looks like a sort of little doily on, on, a, on a table with this sort of bed and a light bulb. And this is where we go in, into, into, into very much the two, I think, influences on the piece, which are, which are Kafka and Wozzeck. Mm. This, this could be um, Kafka's. OK, no, we had to show these. What is happening here? I didn't want to show these, but your marketing department said I had to. It's a so, good thing to see, I've got to be honest. I mean, so what, the biggest what? challenge with the nose is how do you represent a production in which a man loses his nose? Practically, yes. Because he wakes, he's only one little scene where he's getting shaved, and then the third, third scene, he wakes up and he's got he's no gone. nose. So, you know, that's the first thing you have to solve is, what are you going to do? And I think all the productions I've seen, they've done symbol, symbolic nose loss or they've painted it black or whatever. And I said, well, why don't we go the other way? Why don't we give everyone in the cast noses? So they've made, like, I think we have a hundred and something people in the cast. Goodness, yes. Everyone has a nose. And when he loses his nose, he doesn't have the big nose. So we haven't... You, you, you have... Everyone has, been a, has a latex nose which was uh, morphed 
thing of Barbara Streisand's nose. <laughs> and uh, this is true, Bookie, Bookie Schiff and I did this. It's, it's two things. You know, it has to be a Jewish nose. It said, you know, there is, it has to. So it's Barbara Streisand meets um, um, one of those terrible Nazi, anti-Semitic Jewish banker caricatures from a you know, newspaper in Berlin. And we morphed that. Um, so we morphed Barbara and, and a sort of anti-Semitic Jewish banker. And we came up with that. And so, and a lot of them. No, 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 that's different. That's I'll get to that in a moment. So everyone wears uh, these uh, these noses. So everyone's got the same nose, which makes it even weirder. And he loses his nose. And then there's a scene in which um, the nose runs around. And because um, I wanted dance to be quite an important element, um, we decided that the little nose for the first part of the show would be played by a young British tap dancing boy, um, who because we've got a tap dancing nose in this show. And so this poor boy dreamed of Billy Elliot, but in fact he's just he won the a nose. nose. <laughs> and, um, and then it grows into a sort of phantasmagoric scene um, where you will see the world's first Busby Berkeley tap dancing nose scene um, where they tap dance in these noses. And I'm telling you, I don't know how they do it because you can't really see out of it and you can't look at your colleagues, so they have to all do it by some, but there's a sort of Busby Berkeley chorus line of hairy-legged male oh, noses. Um, I mean, you can't sell a show worth, better. Yeah, well, that's worth the price of ticket alone, and that's not even with music, so, you know. Um, Barry, we have incredibly come to the end of our Inside well, Evening. beginning. I know, we could, we could be here for another five hours. <laughs> I'm terribly sorry, but thank you so much for everything that you've offered us so far. Pleasure. Um, it just leaves me to thank, at this point, Andrew Kahn, Martin Winkler, Rosie Aldridge, David Cyrus, Grant Doyle, Alan Ewing, and Barry Kosky. Thank you so much for this incredible insight into what is going to be a really, really fantastic production. Thank you very much. And of course, uh, to Barry, thank you. Thank you. And of course, my thanks to you, audience here, upstairs at the Claw, and everybody who joined us worldwide online. Now, The Nose performs at the Royal Opera House from the 20th of October through to the 9th of November, and tickets are available online at roh.org.uk. Thank you so much for joining us this evening, and a very good night to you all.